Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Scott Wright, also of Rochester. Welcome, Scott. Hey, thanks, Steve. It's always a pleasure to join you on this uh, really acclaimed podcast. Well, certainly on an important subject like today's, which is talking about Inclusoran, the recently approved drug by the FDA, of which you were intimately involved with planning some of the studies and reporting the, the results. So we're really happy to have you here with us since you know so much about the drug. So Scott, tell us about Inclusoran. How does it work? Steve, Inclusoran is a new attempt really to, to modify cholesterol by modulating the uh, synthesis of the PCSK9 protein. It's, as opposed to a lot of the medicines we've used for decades, it's not a pill, but it's an injection. It's differentiated from monoclonal antibodies, which are also injections because it's given less frequently. So it's really part of a new class of products that are called RNA silencing agents or therapies. It's a small interfering double-stranded RNA that can harness the body's natural processes for interfering with the, the translation of message RNA and the production of proteins. So Inclisiran itself is specifically designed to be taken up exclusively by the liver cells or hepatocytes. And once inside the cell, the, uh, the compound dissociates into its sense and antisense strands of RNA. And those strands bind the uh, body's own natural way that it modulates the translation of message RNA, the uh, RNA silencing uh, mechanism, in such a manner that the enclisteran itself binds in such a manner that it disrupts the, body, the ability of the body to make new PCSK9 protein. So instead of binding synthesized PCSK9 protein like monoclonals, it actually prevents the PCSK9 from being synthesized in the first place. So by doing that, it prolongs the life of the LDL clearance receptor on the surface of the liver cell or allows them to be recycled and stay on the receptor surface uh, for a long time. And that removes cholesterol from the body and lowers cholesterol in the plasma substantially, about 50% or more. Fantastic explanation. Thank you. And what did the FDA indicate it for? Oh, it's ind indicated for people who are on maximally tolerated statins or other lipid modifying agents who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or FH and need additional lowering of their LDL cholesterol. So it's not designed as a drug to be used in primary prevention, except maybe in FH, but it's designed to be used after you've tried the oral drugs. And either you can tolerate the full dose of an oral drug or a combination of two drugs, or you don't tolerate it at all. So it's maximally tolerated statin or oral therapy. So you can use statins as etamib. If you want to use Questran, you can use Questran or some of the other agents, but uh, it's designed to be added after you try oral therapy. So it's designed to be added to max tolerated statin. How about azetamide? You know, the PCSK9s were supposed to give as azetamide first per guidelines. I think this drug is too. That's, I think it's the, the language in the package insert, as I recall it, I didn't look at it at just moments before the podcast. So you're, you know, our memories are good, but sometimes short says maximally tolerated oral lipid therapy. So I, I assume is that a mib and because of the cost of the drug, it's not as affordable as generics. I would encourage practitioners to use statins plus azetamide before they decide to step up the therapy to enclisiran or even a monoclonal. You know, I think you look at enclisiran like you do the monoclonals. Uh, it's another option, right? It's always good in the in the med medical field or any any field when you have options for treatment because it allows patients who don't tolerate one group to go to the second group, and it also encourages providers to use these drugs more fully and appropriately because you have multiple choices now in the field. Now, the how is it administered? Is it the same as the um, as the PCS canines? Can we self-administer it? I wish we could, but no, the, the sponsor decided to uh, get it approved as something that should be administered through a healthcare provider. It's unclear to me, maybe not to the sponsor, but unclear to me if that means it has to be in the physician's office or an infusion center, or if it could be administered by a pharmacist. If you go to Walgreens and you, they have someone who can administer this drug once it's been prescribed. So it's not the type of drug that someone will buy and take home and then self-inject. They could. It's very simple. It's a small syringe. You give it every six months in general, right? Uh, and and I'll ask me uh, later on about the administration, the dosing, so I can clarify this statement. But typically, it's given every six months. 
and uh, as opposed to every two weeks with a monoclonal. And it's only one and a half cc's and it's a preloaded syringe. But to give it through a healthcare provider allows it to be billed differently so that it should the cost to patients should be substantially lower than the out-of-pocket cost they typically have with the expensive drugs like monoclonals and others where they have to pay 20 or 25 percent copays or 30 or 40 depending on their insurance coverage. Good. So you, you mentioned the cost. What do we know about the cost of the drug? Well, the company has said that it's going to sell it at approximately $6,500 a year. There's a group of uh, experts, health economists and others called ICER, I-C-E-R, who uh, analyze what these drugs should cost. And that's about 20% above the upper estimate of where they figure the value or where they estimated the value for Inclisiran to be. So it's coming in price just above what ICER has determined to be an appropriate charge. And it's probably a bit more than the monoclonals. I think the market, the street value for the monoclonals is a little bit less than what we are going to see with Inclisiran. Now, I'm sure the company, I haven't heard them say this, but I suspect, like many, that the convenience of giving something twice a year versus every two weeks is justifying the additional cost, the, uh, the additional cost of uh, you know $1,000 or $1,500 or maybe even $2,000 a year. But I think at the end of the day, you and I both know that our patients want what's affordable, and they don't take any of these medications in isolation, meaning that they take them along with several other medicines. And if you have more than one non-generic medicine, it's generally quite expensive on a monthly basis for our patients to have to take a lot of these branded medicines when they cost this much. Now, Scott, if the if the treatment is a baseline, then again, in three months, then every six months. So the first year, the cost would be a little bit higher, right? Closer I believe so, Steve, based on the fact that they're selling it per dose, because when you start with Inclisiran, you take it at the you take it on day one, like you do any medicine. And then there's a booster. So it's a it's an RNA, right? compound, sort of like the vaccines for COVID. So it's a booster. You take it at three months and then every six months thereafter. Now that was uh, sort of designed from the phase two studies that we did. It could have been just given once and then every six months thereafter with about the same degree of lipid lowering, or you could take it even once a year and have, uh, you know, 35 to 40% lowering as opposed to 50 to 55. But it was designed to be dosed in a way that would give maximum LDL lowering. And I think the company who developed the drug didn't anticipate that the uh, cost would be on a per injection basis, it would be on an annual basis. First year, even though you were going to be taking doses on day one, day 90, and then uh, six months after that, so you would get three doses in the first year, uh, the cost would be about the same. Obviously, that changed with Novartis when they purchased it, so they've now brought it out, and it's going to be a bit more expensive the first year. So you're right, Steve, it's going to be you know roughly $3,200 a dose for each time the first year, and then the from then on, it's about $3,200 every six months, depending on the discounts Novartis gives your insurance company and the and any coupons or any over-the-counter discounts they may offer. And I suspect they will, but I haven't heard of those yet. Now, the what about you know about the beneficial effects? How much is it going to lower our LDL and will be on top of in addition to other treatments? Right. We studied it largely on top of statins and statins plus azetamibe. So most of the patients, 93% or so, had statins. Of those, two-thirds or about 70% had high potency or high dose statins, so to maximally tolerated maximum dose statins. About 7 or 8% had azetamibe in combination and about maybe 9% rather, and maybe 7% weren't on any statin at all. So in those who are on statins or statins with azetamibe, we saw about a 55% maximum reduction in LDL over a given year, looking at time average reductions. One study I published showed 52%. One study showed 55 When I looked at the entire pooled analysis, it's about 50%. 50.5, so a little over 50%. So I think for the clinicians listening to this, assume you're going to get a 50% reduction on average. For those who are statin intolerant, who are not taking a statin, the lowering is about the same. And what do we know about side effects, Scott? Yeah, and and the FDA really uh, required the company to disclose, uh, I think, the upper margins of, of the side effect numbers. So when we look at the side effect numbers, uh, Steve, they're publishing now about 8% or so of patients will have an injection site reaction compared to 2% with placebo, meaning uh, either a little bit of a soreness where you inject or more likely redness or an itchiness there. 5% of people had muscle aches as opposed to placebo, which was 4 Four and a half percent of people had UTIs as opposed to placebo at three and a half. The same numbers had diarrhea, pain in the extremity, or perceptions of shortness of breath. What was interesting was that we did discover that a small percentage had bronchitis. 
And this was not true in upper respiratory infection, but just bronchitis defined as a cough. So about 4.3% of patients as opposed to two and a half on placebo. So you may find yourself with a little bit of a bronchitis. We don't know the mechanisms for that or why that is, or whether it's a real observation or just a statistical spurious one, but it did make the product insert. So when providers and patients read about it and see it and they see it advertised on television, they'll hear about those side effects. And, you know, with our, uh, our patients that are statin intolerant, they are always asking, how long am I going to have a side effect? So if this drug is given once every six months, will the side effect last six months or do we know much about that? You know, we didn't gather data on every side effect in terms of duration. So I encourage people who prescribe this and you and I, as we prescribe it, we should monitor for that. The injection site reactions as a rule, we're more monitored and they're all pretty short lived, just a few days to a week. And they typically did not recur, not saying they won't, but they didn't typically did not recur. So if you've got one on the first injection, you may not get it in, on any more injections. In terms of the other side effects, uh, there's always the potential that will go on longer, but uh, one just doesn't know. We, we haven't seen patients or, or the research uh, PIs from the local sites who did the studies for us report them going on and on and on. And we really didn't see patients pulling off the therapies because of side effects. But I think it's fair to say, given its long duration of action, uh, there is the potential for some long duration of side effects. In all fairness, you have to watch for that. Will that be the norm? Probably not. But is it potentially a problem? Yes, of course, like it is with any medicine. And what about uh, long-term beneficial effects? Is that data out yet? Do we know about reduction in cardiovascular events? Well, there have been a couple of attempts to show some of that data as ad hoc analysis. I showed some of it at ACC, and I would caution people not to draw much inferences from that. A another group from um, South Asia, I think, published some data that we've, we've suggested should be retracted because it's not patient-specific data. The truth is we don't know. The, none of the studies were properly powered to really look. So if we did, and we saw a reduction in, in, in MACE in the one study data that I think I showed, but we don't know if that's true or not because it, you know, the studies just were not powered. So I would say like with the monoclonals and like with statins, we just have to wait until the properly powered outcome studies are out. And the Orion 4 study is going forward. Obviously, like any study going through the COVID pandemic, its enrollment was delayed. So it's going to be delayed a little bit on the initial timeline, but we'll see what it shows and it will answer that question. I, I think my own theory, and it, I think it's yours as well, is that LDL lowering is what reduces clinical events. And we've seen that with statins. We've seen it with zetamide. We've seen it with gastric bypass or intestinal bypass surgery. We've seen it with the monoclonals. And so the question is, if you get a robust enough lowering of LDL, your patients have fewer events. And I expect the same with this class of therapy. Now we do the studies to, for both safety and efficacy to show that is that extension exists and that it's safe and that it's not harmful. Yeah, I expect it to show an outcome in terms of benefits, uh, but we just don't have that data yet. When will that be out, do you know? I don't know. I think the study itself has to go a minimum, I think, of two and a half or four years, two and a half to four years. So we're some ways away from that. Okay. Now, what about uh, other effects? Now, the FDA did not approve this for LPA lowering, but does it lower LPA? Right. They didn't approve it. I don't think that was requested, honestly. It lowers LPA about 20%. The monoclonals do the same, maybe a bit more. And then the sponsor, Novartis, has a LPA lowering therapy that will compete in the same arena or same space for this. So when that drug uh, is approved by FDA, it'll be much more potent. But yes, this lowers LPA about 20%. So it's a nice benefit from it, but I wouldn't use it exclusively for that because uh, we just don't know if lowering lipoprotein A reduces clinical events. We still need to see some outcome data for that. We'd like to believe it will. I believe it will likely, but I'm at equipoise. I want to see it proven. Now, what about off-target effects, drug-drug uh, interactions? How do we monitor? What, uh, what do you, can you tell us about that? Well, I'd, we're not really aware of a lot of off-target effects. We've, we've disclosed all of the side effects. Uh, pretty carefully in all of our published data. And you could look in the Jack final analysis I published as well as the New England Journal papers that I published. We didn't see a lot of drug-drug interactions here. I don't specifically recall from the package insert if there are any listed, but I'm, I'm not aware of any. We weren't aware of any when we put these data together for presentation. How about monitoring? 
Other than lipid values, what else should we check? Well, I think they sh we should follow recommended guidance, you know, which is to check liver function tests periodically. Uh, we didn't see any change in liver function tests of any significance, meaning placebo and, and clisiran were comparable, but watch for that. We didn't see any changes in CKs, but if your patients have muscle symptoms, obviously check that. And we didn't see any new onset diabetes, but like with any lipid therapy, I would always monitor for that just out of caution for my own patients periodically and also for their own health purposes. So really, there's not a lot of off-target effects, it doesn't sound like, or anything that was you mentioned in the, uh, in the side effects. Uh, so who, who would be the ideal patient to give this to, and who shouldn't we give it to? You know, who we shouldn't give it to today is someone that I would like to see us be able to give it to down the road. So not to give it today is someone who's a 40-year-old male or female with a large family history, but doesn't have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or any clinical symptoms. So you can't use it for primary prevention, but boy, if you could give it once a year as an injection for primary prevention, it would be an ideal drug. So don't do it for primary prevention, but take your patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or people who have uh, the equivalent with multiple risk factors like type 2 diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, tobacco use, things like that. But take someone with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So maybe you've got someone who's 50 or 55 or 60 or 70 who's had either bypass surgery or PCI or myocardial infarction. And they are on a statin and a zetamibe and their LDL is still 90, 85, 90, 100. And you're like, well, I'm not comfortable. It should be lower. I mean, I personally like to see post-ACS LDLs in the 50 to 55 range because I think there's data there that that's quite effective. So I would give it to someone like that post-ACS or post-revascularization whose LDLs remain above a threshold target to bring that LDL further down and to try to prevent them from having a second event. You also could make the argument that you should give it for someone who has the functional equivalent of ASCVD, like someone with longstanding diabetes whose lipids are not well controlled with oral therapy. So those are the two cases. Cases. And then the most obvious case is the FH patients who really uh, cannot get to any threshold or goal of an LDL with an oral therapy. You know, the heterozygous FH patients that are so challenging to, mon to, to manage who, who really do have events if we don't get their lipids pretty low. And then finally, Scott, was there a statin intolerant group that was yes. prospectively studied? Yes, we did prospectively study that and include those in both the Ryan 10 and 11. And again, it showed about a 50% reduction. And uh, we have separated that data out more and more of our publications. And we've had some abstracts that we've shown both at ESC and AHA on that, Steve. Well, that's great. Anything else you want to add in about the drug? You've given us some wonderful information here today. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a tool. You know, you talk with your patients as you should, you know, try lifestyle and diet first. Uh, never underestimate the benefit of a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Go with the statins. They're generics. They're cheap. And uh, then uh, if that doesn't work, have a discussion. D does your patient prefer to take a drug every two weeks so they don't forget? Or would you like to see them back every six months and give them the injection in your office so that you can be certain they get it delivered? And if uh, compliance with therapy is a challenge, then Inclisiran may be a good option because you can have them back. And even if they don't come back precisely at six months, it still has a duration of action much beyond that. So if they're seven months coming back, they're still getting some benefit as opposed to the monoclonals where it pretty much wears off. The monoclonals are really potent. They, they really grab and bind the PCSK9 for the two or three weeks you have them in. But after that, they sort of wear off. And after a month, if you've skipped a couple of doses, you're back to your baseline. Whereas with Inclisiran, you're not. So it does offer some potential advantage there. Will that translate into usability and practice? I don't know. I also must say that I think the price will be a bit of a barrier for people. I hope not, but I'm, I'm concerned about that. And uh, I think it's going to be in the competitive landscape against the monoclonals and have those discussions with your patients. Because at the end of the day, all of the therapies we have are good. And what we want are therapies that people can both afford and will take. And if any drug doesn't meet those two criteria, it's not going to be effective regardless of how beautiful the data are. I think that's a great point, especially about the lifestyle. We know with statins that if you don't have a good lifestyle, good diet, uh, the statin effect is markedly reduced, and I suspect it's the same with all these others. Well, Scott, we'll have to maybe touch base in a year or so and, and look back and see how the year has gone for these new drugs. But thanks again for joining us today. My pleasure. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.